chapter 23 is going to cover multiple regression analysis and several other multivariate statistical procedures. In multiple regression analysis, two or more predictors, which is to say independent variables, are entered into an equation that predicts an interval ratio level dependent variable. Here is the unstandardized multiple regression equation. So the, uh, the hat uh, conveys predicted value on y, which is to say predicted value uh, on the dependent variable equals a. a is the constant plus b1 times x1 plus b2 times x2 plus bk times xk. So this equation is the same as the unstandardized regression equation that we encountered in chapter 8. The difference is that here we have multiple predictors, whereas in, in the bivariate uh, unstandardized regression equation presented in chapter 8, there was only a single predictor. Now, when you uh, run a computer multiple regression programs, often they pr produce two sets of regression coefficients. They produce Bs, which is to say the unstandardized coefficients, and these are the coefficients uh, presented in the unstandardized multiple regression equation here, and the Bs convey change in original units, that is in raw scores. On the other hand, one has betas, symbolized by the Greek letter beta, and betas are standardized coefficients. These convey change in standard deviation units. Let's look at the difference between B and beta and their bivariate counterparts, B and R, respectively. So the B in multiple regression has much to do with the B in bivariate regression, and, and similarly, R, the correlation coefficient, has much in common with beta. So the key difference is that B and beta uh, in, in multiple regression convey change controlling for other variables in the regression equation. Now, on the other hand, for uh, B and R in uh, bivariate equations, there are no other variables uh, that are controlled for. A predictor's unstandardized coefficient, B, in the multiple regression equation conveys controlling for other predictors in the equation the predicted change in original raw score units in the dependent variable as the predictor increases by one that is by one raw score unit on the other hand a predictor's standardized coefficient beta conveys controlling for other predictors in the analysis, the predicted change in standard deviation units in the dependent variable as the predictor increases by one standard deviation. We will use an example from the special needs adoption study to uh, demonstrate uh, multiple regression analysis. Now, uh, to make sense of uh, our results, and in particular to uh, make good sense of the unstandardized coefficients, the Bs, I'm going to need to convey to you how the various variables in the multiple regression equation are coded. So, uh, the dependent variable is parent-child relationship scale score, and that is a score on a five-item scale. Uh, the lowest possible score is a 1. The highest possible score on that scale is a 4. Uh, 
Now we have uh, four predictors, that is to say, four independent variables. So behavior problem scale score uh, is a score on a standardized instrument. Possible scores range from 0 to 236. Uh, income of the adoptive family is a second predictor. And we code income in thousands of dollars. So for instance, if a family earned $33,000, that would be coded in the data as a 33. And another predictor is mom's education level, and that is measured on a five-point scale. The lowest value is a zero, which conveys uh, not graduating from high school, and then four conveys a graduate degree. A final uh, variable is looking at uh, whether the adopting parent was previously a foster parent to the adopted child. So if that uh, was the case, uh, this variable is coded as 1. If not, it is coded as 0. So here are the results of the uh, multiple regression analysis. Let's Note first that uh, we're presenting uh, both Bs and Betas, and uh, note that uh, the SPSS statistical program presents a, uh, a single significance test for both the uh, standardized coefficient Beta and the unstandardized coefficient B. So if one of these is statistically significant, that is if it differs statistically from zero, uh, then uh, and so also by definition is, is the other. So that uh, instance uh, for the behavior problems uh, predictor, both uh, the, the beta and the B are significant and, and it's the, going to be the precisely the same significance level for each. So uh, to interpret the uh, constant, the constant conveys to us the predicted value of the dependent variable when all predictors in the equation assume the value of zero. So when each of the four predictors has the value of zero, uh, the predicted parent-child relationship scale score is 4.055. Now I, I'm just going to make a, a quick tangent for you that is not something that uh, you would be tested on, in uh, at least in Rosenthal's course. The predicted value when all the predictors equal zero is 4.055. So that is indeed higher than the highest possible uh, value on the uh, dependent variable. The highest possible value is a four. So, I mean, it is indeed in, uh, somewhat unusual to have a situation where the constant uh, constant's value is indeed higher than the uh, the highest possible value on the dependent variable. You might just uh, look at this data for a second, and I mean to say, uh, let's look at a couple of the predictors. Uh, behavior problems uh, shows a, you know, a negative relationship to um, parent-child relationship score. Now, behavior problems, I don't believe, assumes the value of zero for any individual kid. All of the kids have, have a score that's greater than zero. And by the same token, income in thousands of dollars shows negative relationship to a predicted uh, parent-child relationship score. But no families that I'm aware of in the data set have incomes of zero. So th what we're in essence saying here is that if all four of these uh, predictors assume the value of zero, now indeed uh, education mom could assume the value of zero, for a mom without high school education, and so also could foster parent for an adoption that was not by a foster parent. Uh, so if all four of these assume the value of zero, this is our best prediction. But uh, the reason, or one of the reasons this comes out to be greater than four, is that it just simply would not be the case that uh, in, in any given case, all four of these would assume the value of zero, and that's because uh, income thousands and behavior problems. Um, it's, it, these are not uh, pragmatically going to assume such a value.
And, and just an, another a, a tangent, you know, it is often strategic uh, to code variables uh, such that zero has a real meaning. So, I mean, at least zero does have a real meaning. If someone earns uh, zero uh, thousands of dollars, I mean, they are earning uh, zero. But enough for technicalities. So, um, we have, for instance, a B of minus 0 0.0153 for behavior problems. Um, how do we interpret that? And so we interpret that controlling for other predictors in the equation as behavior problems increases by one, predicted parent-child relationship score decreases by 0 0.0153 points. Now given that I did communicate to you how the dependent variable and also how behavior problems were coded, I mean you can at, at least interpret to some degree what this uh, B coefficient of minus 0 0.153 conveys. So uh, behavior problems was measured on a scale from 0 to, to 236. The dependent variable can assume possible values of 1 to 4, so for each increase of one point on that behavior problems scale, the predicted score on the, the four-point child relationship scale decreases by 0.153. So you can interpret it, but clearly that and it's hard to make much intuitive sense out of that interpretation. And, and more uh, to the point that uh, this uh, coefficient doesn't convey size of association. And, and you know, that's our basic advantage of the betas, that the betas do convey size of association. And size of association for beta can be interpreted using the uh, same guidelines as were presented for the correlation coefficient uh, r. So that uh, we see a beta for behavior problems of minus 0.592. Let's interpret that. So, controlling for other predictors in the equation as behavior problems increases by one standard deviation, predicted parent-child relationship score decreases by 0.592 standard deviations. Let me uh, interpret the uh, coefficients for education mom. So recall that uh, mom's education is measured on a five-point scale uh, where uh, the lowest value conveys not completing high school and the highest value conveys uh, graduate school. So uh, as uh, mom's education increases by one point on that scale, uh, the predicted score on the parent-child relationship scale, that those possible scores ranging from 1 to 4, the predicted score uh, decreases by 0 0.043 points. So, I mean, you can indeed interpret that using much the same logic as I used in interpreting the B for behavior problems, but that's difficult. The, neither of these variables are measured in straightforward, familiar measurement metrics for us. So, I mean, the betas are going to be more conducive to interpretation uh, because they are analogous to correlation coefficient. They're conveying change in standard deviation units. Uh, to interpret the beta, uh, controlling for other predictors in the equation as the standard deviation of mom's education increases by one standard deviation predicted uh, parent-child relationship score decreases by 0 0.075 standard deviations. And I mean, I'll, I'll go ahead and interpret size of association here. Uh, for correlation coefficient, uh, correlations of minus 0.1 and also of 0.1 were designated to be indicative of small effects, that is, a small association. So, uh, this uh, beta is uh, just a little bit closer to zero than those values, so this is conveying a weak, or we could even say a very weak, relationship between mom's education
and uh, parent-child relationship score. Even though the relationship is weak, it, it's nevertheless statistically significant at the 0.05 level. And uh, as you know intuitively, uh, this weak relationship uh, is indeed statistically significant, uh, basically because of the large uh, sample size. I don't report the sample sizes here, but, but they're somewhere around uh, 600, so we've got lots of statistical power. So um, this slide here is, is summarizing some of the points that I've just made, that the Bs are your unstandardized coefficients. They do not convey size of association. Your betas are standardized coefficients. They're analogous to R in the bivariate situation. They do convey size of association. Uh, guidelines for R can be used uh, to interpret size of association as conveyed by the betas, so that, for instance, the beta of minus 0.592 for behavior problem score is conveying a very strong a negative relationship between behavior problem score and parent-child relationship score. Now uh, the variables that I'm uh, predicting, uh, interpreting so far, th those predictors were numeric or, I mean, it is the case that uh, education mom was a uh, on a five-point ordinal scale. But, uh, foster parent is uh, coded uh, differently. I mean, foster parent is a is a dichotomous variable. It's got two categories: yes, prior foster parent, or no. Now, foster parent was coded as a dummy variable. It, it is dummy variable coded. Now, what does it mean to say that a variable is a dumb, dummy variable? A variable is a dummy variable uh, when one of its categories is coded as one and the other as zero. Now, it's always helpful in multiple regression to have the lowest category coded as a zero because that, as I described earlier, helps make your constant more interpretable. Uh, it's a good strategy to code the variables as zero and one when they're dichotomous, rather than decode them as one and two, because that makes interpretation of the constant a little bit easier. Uh, but I th the, the bigger advantage of a dummy variable coding uh, is that the two categories of the dummy variable differ by one point. So, but for instance, for foster parent, foster parent status is coded as one, not having been a coded as foster parent is coded as zero, so these values differ by one, and, uh, and this really helps uh, make interpretation straightforward. So let's go ahead and interpret the B, the unstandardized coefficient for foster parent. And interpretation is a controlling for other predictors, child's prior foster parents are predicted to score 0.1154 points higher on the PCRSS than are those who were not prior foster parents. So uh, the fact that the two categories differ by one enables us to have straightforward interpretation of the regression coefficient as the difference between the two categories. So that's the key advantage of dummy variable coding. Now, without uh, going into all of the details, I'm going to say that particularly for dichotomous variables, such as, for instance, foster parent, I like interpretation uh, better uh, using uh, the unstandardized B rather than beta, and the, the text goes into some uh, reasons for this. Now, I mean, it's very important that you remember that predictors not in the multiple regression equation are not controlled for. So, you know, we are seeing more positive results for foster parents than for those who were not prior foster parents. So basically, we've controlled for education status, income, and behavior problems. So this positive association between foster parent and uh, better parent-child relationship 
is not due to the other predictors in the equation. They're controlled for. So holding those constant, we still see this uh, uh, positive relationship. And that's clearly the advantage of multiple regression over bivariate regression. In bivariate regression, you're, you're not controlling for any other predictors. But, but indeed, uh, there are many predictors that are not in our regression equation, and these aren't controlled for. So any of these predictors not in the equation could be exerting influence or bias on the coefficients of the variables that, that are in the equation. And I'll mention one other fine point, and the, the text does speak to this. We are controlling for uh, the actual variables in the equation. So, for instance, we are controlling for a behavior problem score on a particular instrument that measures behavior problems. But any given instrument measures with error. I mean, for instance, when you take a test, you might get an 87 on the test, but, be, but you made some good guesses or have been perhaps some bad ones, and you got lucky in some ways with regards to what specific questions were queried about. So this 87% isn't a perfect measure of your knowledge in the content area. And by the same token, the score on this particular uh, behavioral instrument is not a perfect measure of the degree of behavior problems that a child has. So we're controlling for the measured score on the instrument, and that measured score is always imperfect to some degree. So even though we have a predictor in the equation that measures behavior problems, it's not a perfect measure of them. And that being the case, whenever one of the predictors is measuring with error, I think it's best to think of us as controlling for, I mean, a very good approximation of the concept that that uh, predictor is trying to measure. So in other words, there could still be some small bias uh, traceable to uh, behavior problems. It, behavior problems could still bias the values of the other predictors in the equation uh, because behavior problems is only approximately controlled for, not perfectly controlled for. But that's that's a reason, that's a fairly advanced point. But so think of the predictors as in the equation as having been controlled for very well, but not necessarily perfect. Uh, when you run uh, multiple regression with statistical software, in addition to the uh, the B's and the betas, it'll generate some other uh, statistics for you. It will generate a a capital R. A capital R is the multiple correlation coefficient. How do you interpret capital R? Well, capital R conveys the correlation between predicted scores, the scores predicted by the regression equation, and actual scores. So in our equation, R equals 0.645. So that's a really a fairly strong correlation between predicted and actual scores. If you square large R, you get the squared multiple correlation coefficient. And this conveys the proportion of variance in the dependent variable that is explained by the multiple regression equation. So uh, we uh, obtain multiple R squared by uh, squaring uh, the multiple R. The squared multiple correlation coefficient in our equation is 0.416. That's the proportion of variance in parent-child relationship score that is uh, explained by the predictors. Now the uh, squared multiple correlation coefficient tends to have a slight upwards bias. And this is uh, smaller the uh, sample size, the greater the bias. And, uh, and more specifically, the greater the, the, uh, the number of predictors in relationship to the sample size, the greater the bias. So you get, if you have many, say you have many predictors, say you have five or six predictors and only 50 or 60 cases, that's a situation where you'd have lots and lots of, of bias. And so um, your statistical software will 
calculate um, an adjusted R-squared, an adjusted squared multiple correlation coefficient, and that gives a more accurate estimate of R-squared in the population, which is to say in the, uh, the population from which your sample was randomly selected. And in R regression, the adjusted R-squared is 0.412. So you can see that it is, has a value that is slightly lower than does uh, R squared. So we've uh, in interpreted uh, some of the key statistics uh, that uh, are calculated as part of multiple regression. Um, I haven't talked about uh, the assumptions of multiple regression. So one assumption is that the dependent variable should be at the interval ratio level of measurement. A second assumption is that uh, residuals should be normally distributed around predicted values. I mean, in, in essence, that means they should be normally distributed around the uh, regression line, uh, the line that uh, is predicted from the equation, and also uh, the variance of residuals around the predicted value should be equal. So that's an, uh, the equality of variance assumption. What is a residual? A residual is the difference between a case's actual score on the dependent variable and its predicted score. Another term for residual that's sometimes used is error. So what we want to do next is uh, take a look at uh, the residuals in uh, our multiple regression and see how well the second and third assumptions are met. So, uh, predicted scores are conveyed by the uh, x-axis and actual scores for each case by the y-axis. So the, the residuals are varying uh, vertically around the regression line. So let's go ahead and focus on these residuals. First, note that uh, the residuals are, in general, more spread out below the line than, than above it. So right here, here's our spread above the line, fairly compacted. Here's our spread below the line. The residuals tend to be more spread out below the line. Uh, let's move over here. And um, here's our spread above the line. And again, residuals tend to be more spread out below the line. So uh, on balance our residuals are uh, negatively skewed uh, around the values predicted by the regression equation. Uh, so uh, basically speaking the normality assumption uh, is not met in, in this regression. Now, the equality of uh, variances assumption in essence is saying that residuals should be spread out equally at all points along the regression line. But uh, you can see that the residuals tend to be more spread out on the left side of the line. So for instance, let me sort of convey that spread. There's, there's the spread here. Now as we move towards higher predicted values, we tend to get less spread as for instance here and how much spread do we have at, at these very high values, uh, the spread is compacted even more. So as the predicted values go up and up, the, uh, the variance of the residuals tends to decrease. So uh, what we're seeing then is a regression in which the third assumption also is not met. That is to say the equality of variance assumption is not met. So what are some strategies to follow when assumptions are violated? When the uh, normality and equality of variances assumptions uh, are not met, it's often, the, particularly the normality assumption, it's often the case that the dependent variable is not normally distributed. So one of the things that you can do to help your regression better meet, uh, in particular, the normality assumption is to uh, transform it. So in other words, in the prior chapter, uh, we talked about transforming variables so that they assumed a distributional shape that was more normal. 
So we would, would want to try and uh, transform our dependent variable to a, get it to assume a more nearly normal shape and then um, rerun the regression. If that didn't, didn't work, we also can go ahead and transform predictors. Now, as some predictors, it's impossible to transform. You can't transform, for instance, the dummy variable foster parent. So, I did indeed carry out various transformations, particularly of the dependent variable, trying to get the regression to run in a way that the uh, normality of residuals and equality of variance of residuals assumptions would be better met. And uh, a footnote in the text describes the, the transformations that I carried out and, these tran and also why these transformations ultimately helped only to a limited degree. But indeed the transformations uh, did help only to a limited degree. And so I basically uh, decided to stick with the original regression results. And one of the reasons I stuck with the original regression results is that the, the significance levels, the probability levels for the different predictors changed very, very little under the different transformations. So that was telling me that in essence I was getting the, the same results regardless of the uh, the shape of the distribution of, um, in particular, the dependent variable. So, I mean, on, on balance, uh, regression is reasonably robust to the normality and equality of variances assumptions. So, uh, you know, I think some, some work at transformation is, is often uh, good to help meet these assumptions, but even when the, they're met, only approximately or when they're violated to some degree. Re regression is fairly robust. But uh, given that the assumptions are not met in uh, the regression that, that I just presented, uh, clearly the probability levels in our regression have some degree of inaccuracy and should be interpreted as such. Now, what would a Scatter plot of residuals look like for regression if indeed their, their normality and equality of variances assumptions were met. Here is a, a regression where the residuals fit well and meet the two just mentioned assumptions. Now, I mean, it appears that the, the dots are more spread out in, in the center. But that's not really the case. I mean, there's an appearance of greater spread because there are more dots clustered near the center. So thus, there's more opportunity for uh, uh, dots that will uh, have uh, values that differ considerably from, from the line. But uh, st the standard deviation, or we could equally well say the variance of these dots is, is really quite uh, very much the same at different points along this regression line. And uh, you can see um, also that uh, there's no indication of a, a, of a skew to the residuals, so the dots are, are pretty equally spread out on uh, the high side and the low side of, of the line. So the next video talks more about uh, multiple regression, and uh, we'll go on to it now.